All right, so here's an animation I finished a few days ago, and I'm just gonna run you through the full process of how I put everything together. I've basically just cut it down to the most important parts. Here's my starting point a reference, uh, which is just a render I finished like a year ago or something. I just wanted to do an animated version. So started with a video of an eye. This is from, I believe, Pexels. And I'm just running that straight into the emission color on a plane and then also the alpha. Um, actually, I switched the emission color in a second, but basically just drop the video into the shader editor and then set the number of frames. And you, you have now a video texture, just like a regular image texture, except when you press play on the timeline, now you just have a video, as long as you've imported footage, obviously. So that goes into the alpha and the emission color. But again, I'll swap that in a second. Here, I just did a quick uh, UV unwrap, just cube project, line this up so that the eye is basically just in the middle and then drop a color ramp into where the alpha is running in. I'm taking out the emission and just making that red because I wanted it to be like, just like that original render I showed you there. And yeah, just adjusting, just getting like basic ideas out here. It doesn't need to be perfect straight away. So just kind of figuring it out at this point. The rest of this design was basically just adding squares around this original square. So another emission texture, just red, regular square, just like just take a plane, inset it, delete the middle face. And I'm taking a texture from location textures, displacement maps. You could make your own a mid journey or find some other one, JS placement, whatever. But that's just running into the alpha and that just kind of gives like free detail basically. So you can see me just using a color ramp to again, increase the contrast. Here's what I mean, you can make it a mid journey too. So these are AI generated glitchy map things that I made in mid journey. And uh, that I'm just actually mixing into the eye texture. So mix RGB, switch it to multiply, run that into slot B, increase the factor in a second, but mainly just take a color ramp and just crank the contrast. And uh, there we go, make increase factor. And then, uh, yeah, that's how you get that like glitchy look on pretty much any texture. So I just kind of messed around with settings until it kind of fit a bit better. Cause I wanted this to look a little bit more, I don't know, techy, glitchy. I don't really know what, what this look is, but just less like stock footage and more like cool. So that's what I'm doing there. I did start by animating the texture. It's kind of a fun way to, to animate still textures is like just take a the mapping node and just anim like keyframe the Y position or the X position. I ended up not doing that in this though. Uh, I kind of got rid of it the, at the end, but it's a fun technique sometimes. Here I'm just duplicating those same squares, just adding, I don't know, more detail by just duplicating the same geometry over itself. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing that crazy. Just literally just adding squares with an emission texture. With these emissive textures, I always like to keep the lines pretty thin and like intricate. I find that's just more interesting. Uh, and then, yeah, on the main texture, I did end up keeping this animated. I'm just keyframing the Y position on that mapping node and kind of making it randomly go up and down and stay at a location, go up a bit, stay, go down, stay. And then that just kind of makes it all wobble around and have like this flowing weird thing that's just kind of moving and more alive. Not really sure what this is, but I don't know. I thought it's cool. So uh, anyways, I'm just kind of naming these textures now, keeping things organized because I think I ended up adding another one. Yeah. So one of them has that displacement map animated. I duplicated that, switched up the texture to get rid of that, uh, all the animated stuff and just left it solid just for some like, you know, solid squares that aren't uh, affected by that like alpha displacement map thing. And then I don't know, the rest of this, I was kind of just messing around with random shapes up and down. Uh, I don't know, I don't even know what I was doing here, honestly, just putting like random, putting like random shapes on the top and bottom. I think I ended up adding like a wireframe here. Yeah, and then like doing some weird subdivisions and then I don't even know, I think I deleted the back plate of this, but that's what that is just like, a random mesh that's subdivided and wireframed with an emission texture. So once I had all of this stuff kind of done, I just selected all of it and then parented it, all of that to an empty, so just empty cube, select all of that stuff and then just control P uh, and then just parent that to that cube empty. And that just means that when I grab that, it's really easy to just move it around like this without uh, affecting it all. And I don't have to join it together. Okay, so there I just added a floor, just to add a plane. And then I'm taking a grunge map from Quixel Mega Scans, dropping that roughness slash grunge map thing onto just a new texture on the floor. And that is like the main part of this 
material that's pretty much on everything in this render is that Quixel roughness map. You could, if you don't want to get Quixel, you could just get like a metal texture from any website, any free website, like textures.com, MBTG, whatever, and just use, uh, just like find a metal texture, take the roughness map from that, and that'll give you a pretty similar result, or even just run a noise texture with high detail and high roughness into the roughness input as well. That could work. And then just make the color black like I did there. I didn't show it, but I have volumetrics in here now. Uh, it's just my standard setup. Add a cube, throw on a volume scatter node. Density is probably at 0 0.01 and anisotropy is at probably like 0.7. Just by standard setup. I have other videos on that. And then, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you can see it right there. And that's just going to get scaled up. Here, I'm just adding the wall on one side. And then just I'll just duplicate it to the other side after. For some reason, mirror modifiers always glitch for me in an uh, animation. So I'm just manually doing it twice. But my technique to get detail here was just add kind of like random loop cuts and extrusions um, and like subdividing random parts of this and just pulling them in and out. It's kind of a weird strategy, but I don't know. I thought it looked cool. And I went a little too extreme at first and I kind of dialed it down in the end, but I just wanted some sort of like thing that wasn't flat. So that's what I did for that. And I think I ended up adding a bit more detail after, but... Yeah, the main like chunks of this are just kind of, you can see I'm just like kind of randomly selecting squares and like extruding pieces inwards and outwards. Okay, here I'm adding an area light and I'm just making it a little bit blue to balance out the very strong red that's coming from the center thing. I think I ended up switching around like the, the power and size quite a bit throughout this process, but it was it's still just an area light in the end. Here, I'm actually taking that same displacement map I put on the original uh, red texture, and I'm dropping it into the wall slash like metal dark texture on the side on the floor and wall there. That's running through a bump node. And then that, if I zoom in here, you can see it's adding a lot of detail from that uh, displacement map there. So again, I'm not like affiliated, but it's from these guys location textures they sent me a free pack and i've just been using it for so long it's a really good pack uh very similar to like js placement but like higher quality and i don't think js placement even exists anymore anyways you can see i just duplicated manually that wall over to the other side and then flipped it 180 degrees so it's not actually mirrored it's just rotated the other way so it's like not perfectly symmetrical but it's like slightly different which is kind of what i wanted and I'm duplicating it over itself again and just kind of finding a new position to put that in just for some extra cool like leading lines on the side that kind of like guide you towards the center a little bit, you know? Um, yeah, this ended up being kind of weird. Like this whole thing's weird. None of it makes sense, but I, I don't know. It's uh, I, that's a lot of my renders. None of them really make sense. Just duplicating that again, dropping it to the floor this time and just having it kind of intersect there. So. From that one piece of geometry, that weird thing that I modeled with just random extrusions and insets, I've got like the whole scene mapped out now just from that one piece. And that's something I do a lot is just like duplicate, like make one thing, duplicate it a bunch of times, and then there you go. It's like pretty much fills out your whole scene. I'm just dropping in a person here. This is a placeholder. I did not end up using this exact model, but I just wanted somebody in there for kind of a sense of how big everything was and how it fits all together in the final like composition. And I don't know what I'm doing here. Oh, just adjusting the uh, roughness. Yeah, I was just adjusting the roughness of those materials with a color ramp. Here, I'm just adding a particle system. Last video I did on my channel was all like pretty much mostly about adding a particle system, but it's just a regular emitter particle system with uh, just like gravity disabled and then throw in a turbulence force field. And I ended up adding I had strength default and then I just added flow I set it to one I didn't show it here but in the end it was set to one and that just made uh that just kind of makes the particles randomly drift around it's kind of like adding noise but yeah just a regular emitter emitter sorry I can't talk emitter particle system with the particle object being uh an icosphere with one level of subdivision like as low poly as possible and then just like kind of a translucent shader on that icosphere that's it so you can see me just kind of getting this set up here, uh, their icosphere, one subdivision, and then scale it way down, shade it smooth, new texture, add shader, add it to a translucent, 
and then just mix it with a transparent to kind of lower the opacity. So yeah, transparent, mix shader there, leave it on 50%. And then that way it's just like half translucent, half like transparent. So kind of like taking the opacity on 50% basically. Okay, uh, next, what did I do? Oh, just render as object, make that object the icosphere. And there we go, it's now working. And I think I had to turn the scale way down because those are ginormous, but that's pretty much the whole setup. Um, but yeah, last video I spent way too long talking about particle systems. I'm not gonna do it in this one, but yeah, just regular, regular emitter particle system. There's that turbulence. Again, I didn't show it here, but I did set the flow to one and then just baked it and then it was good. And that's the the system I use in pretty much all of my renders that have these kind of animated dust particles is exactly what I just showed. And you can see what that looks like in the in the test render I just did here. So there's they're still a little big, those particles. I actually scaled it down in the end, but it's pretty much all the same. I ended up after that test render just kind of tweaking the main eye texture in the middle to kind of fit a little bit better. Um, you can see it's actually chugging down quite a lot, like the frame rate's dropping a, a good amount. One thing you can do is just on your footage, uh, I'll, I'll show it in a sec, but just uh, disable the uh, auto refresh thing. Uh, we'll get, the, get to that in a sec though. For these blue outlines on the walls, what I did was I took, I just duplicated the wall, threw on a wireframe modifier, and then switched the texture to this emissive thing, like just blue emission on the wireframe, on the wireframe to version of the wall. And then if you run a noise texture into that, and then just run the, like have it control the alpha of that emission, then you can kind of just like get a weird, uh, I don't know, like it just kind of mixes it up so it's not fully just the same emission level everywhere. And then I just animated the Y position on that noise texture. So it was kind of moving towards the camera in like a weird flowing kind of motion. Not that noticeable in the render, but it just adds a little bit more movement and like stuff going on. So it's not just like a static, like bare bones emission, you know? I hope I'm not going too fast here, but so you can see it was really starting to get laggy here. So what I did was on that eye video on the footage, I just went into here, turned off auto refresh on both of those. So that means that in the playback in the viewport, it's like, it'll just be a static image, but in the final render, it'll be like the full video. But for some reason that just speeds up playback a lot when you don't have like videos actually playing in the viewport. Okay. So here I dropped in a photo scan of myself. I've used this one in a lot of renders. And uh, I just did this Ian Hubert technique of like adding a very simple armature, like three bones, and then parent, it, uh, parent the photo scan to that armature with automatic weights. And then you just take like the head uh, bone and just kind of like randomly animate it around. Just like add a couple of rotation keyframes throughout the thing. That's just like a really easy way to like kind of fake somebody being animated. What I was doing there was just adding in random rocks and like debris and uh, other crap from Quixel mega scans. You can like for stuff like this, you can kind of do anything, just load in like any object that seems like it would be cool there and just like put it in and it will probably fit like in a weird abstract render like this. It doesn't really matter what you put in there. Uh, as long as there's just like detail, you can kind of do whatever you want. So that's what I did. But yeah, let me just get to, let's talk about the render settings and kind of how I exported this animation and all the technical crap that I had to do to export it. All right, let me show you the render settings for this one. So what you were seeing before this was the Instagram version. So it was all the same settings, just with the aspect ratio the other way. So instead of this one is 1920 by 1080, the other one was 1080 by 1920, but everything else is the same. So it's set to that, except I've turned it up to the percentage slider is up at 120%. I'd like to go a little bit higher than the resolution that I'm actually gonna render at or the, or the resolution I actually want just because I find that if you have more pixels rendering, it just kind of makes the noise a little bit nicer and you don't have to do that, but I just find it looks a bit nicer. My frame rate is 24 FPS for this one and I'm rendering this as a PNG sequence. The reason I'm doing that instead of like an MP4, a couple of reasons. One is if it crashes while rendering an MP4, which does happen sometimes, I've had that happen during client work, it's terrible. Um, you lose the whole file and you just have to restart the whole render. But if you switch it to PNG sequence, then it means that if it gets halfway through the render and then crashes, it's still saved half the render as PNGs and you can just start from wherever it crashed and left off. And that's really handy because it means that I don't have to waste as much time if it crashes and uh, just saves a bit of time 
it just makes me feel better. So the way you render as a PNG sequence, it sounds scary if you've never used that before, but it's actually very simple. So here's exactly how you do it. You just click this folder button right here, make a new folder. So yeah, I just made this new one here called desktop version. And then you just open up that folder, hit accept, and then it'll just render all these PNGs in there. You don't have to name it or anything. And yeah. And so yeah, you just switch the file format from like whatever it is over to PNG if it's not there by default, and then you're good to go. So what that is going to do is it's just going to deposit a bunch of PNGs, every individual frame into one big folder. And most video editing softwares, which I'll show you how to deal with this in After Effects in a second, but pretty much any video editing software is going to let you import this as an image sequence, and then you'll be able to just play it back smoothly as a video. So I know it looks kind of scary having like this ginormous folder of pictures, but don't worry, it's very easy to deal with. I'll show you how in a sec. Okay, so that's there. And then I think the only th other thing I need to cover is maybe samples and a couple other things. So samples, I did 120 samples. That's usually the range ish that I do for animations, like one to 300 samples ish. You can usually get away with fine. And it, it's actually going to look a bit bad when I bring it into After Effects, but I'll show you the denoising uh, like slash temporal filtering setting thing that I'm using in there to make it a lot smoother and, and uh, nicer and less like blotchy and grainy. Anyways, 120 samples is fine for this. I know that sounds low, but just trust me, it actually is fine. And light paths, uh, this is not very important. Caustics are off, but you can see all my settings there. I have this on fast GI approximation. I don't think that's really helping that much. It may or may not have made it faster, but I turned it on and it made it look, it didn't make it look any different, so I just left it on, but usually I don't really use that. Motion blur is turned up to 0 0.8. That's what I found looked good. So that's on there. And then I also have depth of field on the camera here, which is turned up to F7. So again, the higher this number is, the less blur you're going to get. So I actually found it was too much at like the default of F2.8 or whatever. So I turned it up to F7. So it means a little bit less blur. It's focused on the plane in the background. So it just means a little bit of the stuff very, very close to the camera is going to be a little bit blurred. So like some of these dust particles maybe, and that's it. And yeah, we're just at 24 millimeters. Camera is getting animated. Just one keyframe at the start, one keyframe at the end, just going through there. And I think that's it for the render settings. Next, let me show you how to bring this into After Effects and actually deal with that PNG sequence and make it look good.